this uh, is the third uh, Sunday in Advent, as we've already discussed. And we're going to start out with probably a, a s scripture that's part of the Christmas narrative that many of you are familiar with. It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Nearby shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. Their Lord, the Lord's angel stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. As you've already seen from lighting the, the candles that today's theme is joy. This, sun, this Sunday is also known as Gaudete Sunday. Got that? Gaudete. Say it with me. Gaudete. You got it. The word gaudete comes from the, from the Latin that means rejoice, to be joyful. So that's why we call it gaudete. We're surrounded uh, by joy today, embodied by it. And you may no notice, some of you who are awake may have noticed that today's candle is a different color. How many of you noticed that? Very good, very good. And you're uh, probably wonder why that candle is a different color. Well, I'm about to tell you, okay? So today the candle, usually the other candles are kind of a purple color. Today for Gaudete Sunday, it's pink because that's the traditional color that symbolizes joy. Actually, it's more of a pinkish rose, but it, we got a, a pink candle up here to represent day of joy, Sunday of joy. And Advent is a season of waiting, and today we're called to be joyful as we await the coming of the Christ child. So in the scripture passage, we hear the angels coming Actually, first of all, just one angel coming to uh, the shepherds watching their flock at night to announce that God, the good news of an extraordinary event, the coming of the Messiah, news that will bring great joy to all people. A Savior is born in Bethlehem, Christ the Lord. So can you imagine you're out in the field at night, a very tranquil pastoral scene, and all of a sudden you're interrupted by an angel? Joy is not the, my first reaction when that happens. Is I don't think it was their first reaction either. I think it was, it was heart-stopping fear would be a better description of that reaction. But the angel, the angel tells the shepherds, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, which I don't think how well it went over because right after he said that, a whole bunch of more angels came, the, the host, of, a host of angels, a great assembly, an even greater number of them. But you think of, they announced the news of Christ coming and of great joy. What would be joy to a shepherd? Did you ever think about that? What would be a joy? Uh, to be in, out in the stillness and tranquility of the open field. Someone walks out with a big jar of cold water, you know, and, and uh, gives it to you for free. Or, 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 or they've got a, a fresh baked bread for you. A clean set of clothes or fresh sandals for you. Or the, the pack of wolves were, were emerged from the forest to say, Okay, we'll just leave you alone today, okay? We'll wander off and we'll just leave you alone. You just watch your sheep. You'll be okay. Would that bring them joy? Would that bring them joy? Uh, joy may be seen to be an alien term to shepherds. They certainly didn't appear to have a very joy-filled life. In time of uh, Jesus, shepherding and shepherds were despised. They were scorned as unclean. In the first century, shepherds were kind of the lowest uh, so, so socioeconomic rung of the ladder. Many of the Jews were shepherds. We see that Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac were all shepherds. But they were considered less educated, and they lived in poverty. You might, you might own sheep. You might be very wealthy for owning sheep. But if you're the guy tending sheep at night, you're kind of at the bottom rung of the ladder in a corporate organization. You're either the youngest child or, or you're a hired hand. Shepherds, of course, you can imagine, were dirty and smelly because all they did was hang around sheep all day, and they smelled like the sheep. They were considered insignificant. Nobody wanted much to do with them. And some rabbis in Jesus' day held that shepherds, because of their wandering trespass, trespass nature of their job, they could never be forgiven because they could never make retribution for the grasses 
that their flocks ate or stole, as they look at, off of someone else's land. The religious culture of the day therefore considered shepherds reprehensible people, practicing a shameful profession. So what would bring joy to their meager existence? You ever think about that? What would bring shepherd a joy? But I guess we have to ask that of ourselves, too. What would bring us joy? What would joy look like for us? How would we recognize joy when we have it? Is joy the same as pleasure or as happiness? Is it a full bank account or a car that runs or a great night out on a Saturday night or a good report card or getting a raise or a great family day outing? Or is it something meatier like freedom from fear, freedom from the burdens of life, being comfortable or, or being at peace? Is, is joy an emotion or is it a state of mind? I know I've got a lot of questions today, don't I? But I just wanted to get you to reflect on what do you think of joy? When you hear about joy, what do you think of? What do you think of? And we are bombarded with messages about the joy of Christmas. There are numerous Christmas carols that, that, that's, that sing of the virtues of the joys of Christmas. But for some, for many, there's a bit of a hollow ring each year when we speak of joy. Christmas for some, not very merry, not very joyful. But it's the most wonderful time of the year. Isn't that what that song says? That's what it's supposed to feel like, right? The most wonderful time of the year. Only it's not. It's not for everyone. It, it, it's turned into the stressful time of year, hasn't it? We, we don't seem to have enough hours in the day to get everything done. We've got to buy presents. We've got to parties to attend. We've got decorations to go to. We've got children's events to attend. Uh, you know, got relatives and friends to visit. And, and you can't get anywhere in town because the traffic is horrible. Uh, you're at a standstill, especially if you're on Bloomingdale. And, and you find that perfect gift. You have this experience. You find that perfect gift for someone uh, that's special to you. And Amazon says it won't come till after Christmas. <laughs> it doesn't feel like sometimes that's the most wonderful time of the year, does it? We can just admit this. This year has been a tough year. You know, we thought that this COVID crisis would be over with by now. I remember saying last year at this time, said, oh, just think about next year. We'll have so much hope because COVID is, uh, will be over. We'll be over with it. But it still lingers on. It still lingers on. Every year on the first Sunday of November, it's All Saints Sunday. We honor and remember those from our church uh, community who we've lost in the past year. This past November, we honored 24 souls, the most we've ever lost in one year, according to what people remember. So for many in our community, there will be an empty chair at the table at Christmas this year. And, and our grief chair and our divorce care support groups at the church, they're overflowing. The despair at this time of the year seems too much to bear for us. It's the most wonderful time of the year. For some, no, it's not. It's not. And trying to smile and say Merry Christmas is not going to make it any better. Or wishing someone a Happy New Year when you're not even sure how you're going to make it through the next year. It's pretty near impossible. The Christmas holidays are supposed to be times of peace and joy and happiness. The media, we see these perfect images of family and friends, foods and parties and gifts that puts it at a high standard. We're all supposed to meet. Everybody's having a good time. Our homes are festively decorated, just like you see in Martha Stewart, right? It's supposed to be a time of joy and celebration, but it's not for some. It's not for many. If it is a season of joy and happiness, how come we all too often seem so angry, so stressed, so strung out? And we wonder, what's wrong with us? We can't even get in the Christmas spirit. And everybody else apparently appears to be, be doing so. And we may know why we're not in the Christmas spirit this year. There may be a very good reason why you don't feel so joyful during this, during this time of the year. But, but it's Christmas. We should be able to put our pain to the side to, to renew us in our festive spirit. It's Christmas. Let's get in a good mood. 
why can't we make ourselves happy enjoying this season like we see all the people on TV? Well, you know, even Ebenezer Scrooge caught the Christmas spirit eventually. For some, Christmas doesn't always bring up some happy memories. Sleigh rides through the snow, happy families gathered around the fireplace singing Christmas carols while Aunt Gladys plays the piano. That may not be your photo album of your Christmases. We all have Christmases we'd like to forget. There was a Christmas that I would soon not remember. There was a time when Christmas I was alone in Texas by myself, couldn't afford to fly home to be with my family. I spent all day in bed with a stomach flu. And uh, this was, there was a freak cold front in Houston, believe it or not, where the temperatures were down in the teens, and the furnace went out in the house. So I'm covered with all those bundles of blanket. I couldn't find anybody to come on Christmas Day to fix the furnace. You know, I could look back at that Christmas now and just kind of laugh it off. Yet there are some memories of Christmas past in reality that could be quite painful that are not so easy to forget. So painful, there's not even enough eggnog in the world to make you feel better, to make it a joyous time. So painful, there's a time of year that we just try to get through it instead of celebrating. It's the most wonderful time of the year. In truth, it really hasn't been the most wonderful time of the year. Let's just think of that very first Christmas. Let's look see at that. The story of the birth of Jesus is not a very jolly story, is it? It's the story of a teenage girl pregnant with a child that's not her husband's. It's the story of a young girl and a husband that when she found herself in labor, she was basically homeless. It's the story of a child born in a dirty animal stall. It's the story of a family of refugees who had to flee their homeland so that the child would not be killed. It's a story of a young couple who brought their baby son on the eighth day to, to be dedicated in the temple, but they didn't have enough money to have him dedicated, so they asked to use two pigeons to sacrifice. It's a story of a jealous king who was so threatened by the word about a new king being born in Bethlehem that he had all the baby boys killed in that area. This isn't a very happy story. It's the story of one sent into the world in peace who was eventually condemned to death. So, so don't get the sense that there is something wrong with you if, if your Christmas doesn't instantly bring waves of joy and peace and goodwill toward men. Now, you can say it's not the most wonderful time of the, of the year. But you know, the paradox is, it actually is the most wonderful time of the year. If you forget about the tinsel and the trees, if you forget about the parties and the jolly tidings, if you forget about the presents and the ornaments and the trappings, it, it's, if we forget about the warm and cozy scenes of the happy family gathered around the Christmas tree sharing Christmas, if we forget about that, it's the most wonderful time of the year, not because we have to be cheery, happy, and merry, but because we don't. We can be real. We can be real with our pain. We can have heavy spirits, shattered dreams, deep sorrow, broken hearts, deep wounds. And in all these things, God still comes to us. God still comes to us. God relentlessly pursues us to comfort us, to redeem us, to save us, to give us hope to grant us peace. Even to the extreme, they came to be one of us, as one of us, so we could feel, he could feel the same experience that we have. The happy times, yet even more importantly, the painful times. For God's love and grace for us is not diminished by the darkness we may feel. So let's remember the story. Mary was alone and afraid, yet God was with her and exalted her. Joseph was disgraced, his, his, uh, his fiancée was pregnant. Yet God revealed to Joseph the wondrous purpose for his life. The shepherds were afraid, yet God gave them comfort. The magi were in danger, yet God protected them. The lowly were in prison, yet Jesus came to set them free. The blind wandered aimlessly, yet Christ gave them eyes to see. The sorrowful grieved deeply, yet Christ came to wipe away the tears. We may be alone, yet in Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God is with us. The world was in darkness, yet God sent the light of life to shine in the darkness. We celebrate this Christmas season. This is why 
Jesus came to us for these times when we're feeling the darkness, when we're further pain in our life, not to disregard it. Christmas can be a time of anxiety, a time when we come face to face with the pain in our lives. It's the season when the basic questions of our lives are pushed to the forefront. It's a time when we must face the deep loss in our lives, the broken hearts, the shattered dreams. And, and we feel as the people of Israel in the time of Isaiah, walking, wandering, lost in the wilderness. For in the wilderness, in the scripture, is always a place of confusion, of chaos, a place of being lost, seeking direction. The place where we've lost our bearing in life and wonder if we'll ever get it back in the wilderness. Yet the prophet Isaiah reminded the people of Israel that there will come a time when a path will be made through the wilderness. A voice is crying out, clear the Lord's way in the desert. Make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level and rough terrain a valley plain. The Lord's glory will appear and all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. Through that, through that chaos and confusion in our lives, Jesus comes to give us a path through the wilderness where every valley will be raised up and every mountain will be made low. The rough ground will be leveled. The rugged places will be a plain into our feet, making a straight path even in the wilderness in our lives. And when this happens, the glory of God will be revealed and everyone together will see it. This is why, this is why we have Christmas. This is why Jesus came. Christmas is a season that reminds us of the coming of the Christ child who comes bearing a straight bath path for our feet through the wilderness in our lives so that our valleys are raised up and our mountains are made low. It reminds us that God came to us in the flesh to become one of us, one with us, so that we may see that light through the darkness. We may not feel jolly. We may struggle to sing of chestnuts ro roasting on an open fire. We may struggle to get the, even the words Merry Christmas out of our mouth. We may not even feel like putting on that Christmas sweater with a reindeer and Santa on the sleigh. But you know what? That's okay. That's okay. The message of Christmas is not about being jolly and bearing glad tidings. It's a story of one who came to bring us light into the darkness of our lives, to the darkness in our world. It's not a time in which we try to ignore the darkness in our lives. To pretend that the darkness doesn't exist. Or to think that if we just get in the Christmas spirit, the darkness will go away. I'm not here to tell you that scripture says, cheer up. Or to give you a happy song to sing in your heart. To make you feel lively and forget about the darkness that ho hovers in your life. Or to tell you to just get over it. It's Christmas. Scripture never denies the existence of the darkness. Never denies its reality. Just as we cannot deny the pain in our lives that we may feel at some time. God knows the darkness in our life. He cares deeply that we are hurting. This is why Christ came for us. This is what we celebrate during the Advent and Christmas season. And through Christ, God has given us a real light. A light that can punch a hole in the darkness. And God has given us the great light. And it is the light for which darkness can never, ever, ever, ever overcome. As we're in the midst of the, the Advent season, preparing ourselves for the coming of the Christ child in the manger, we acknowledge that the light of Christ in our lives, for which we're reminded of during this Christmas season, a light that truly shines through the deepest of our darkness, for which darkness can never overcome. For that is the true meaning of Christmas. This is where we find true joy.